Simple Cyber Defense Security Updates for August 20th, 2021. Welcome back to Simple Cyber Defense. This week we have some interesting topics, one involving IoT devices and the new glowworm attacks for routers and record, or recording devices, sorry. <laughs> and also we're gonna talk about two data breaches that affect T-Mobiles and senior citizens. So my name is Carl, I'm joined with. Hi, this is Ahmad. We're going to get started with the critical bug for IoT devices. So if you want to start, Omad, or um, I'm ready. So this was uh, uh, reported by uh, Belief in Computers, saying that there's a critical bug impacting millions of IoT devices. Let's hackers spy on you. What are IoT devices? IoT stands for Internet of Things. So things like your Ring cameras, your Blink cams, your uh, smart TV or smart washer and dryer, your baby monitor, everything that can, your lights, if you have smart lights, anything in your house that is a thing that you use, like your your um, uh, your uh, Alexa speakers, your Google speakers, etc. So it's something that's very important because that is something that is around, these are things that are around us and they're only going to get more, the more affordable they become, the more people want to invest in smart homes or making their existing homes smarter so that's why it's very important um uh the uh here what, what's reported on bleeping computers that the re security researchers are sounding the alarm on critical vulnerabilities affecting tens of millions of devices now uh the this this security issue is for products from various manufacturers a lot of manufacturers use this service or this protocol uh, through a company called ThruTech, and the platform we use is called Calais IoT Cloud Platform. It's a platform or a protocol that connects all these IoT devices together or connects your, um, how your, it's kind of like the, the, the language that your chip, your chipset vendors use to talk with your brand name, telecom operators, your cloud infrastructure, solution providers, the ODM, OEM manufacturer, all these people, when it comes to that little camera that you have, it has all these companies or all these people involved in the manufacturing, the operation of it. They need to have the protocol to communicate with one another. Um, so the researchers at, at Mandiant's red team discovered that the vulnerability and that they discovered at the end of 2020, and they worked with the US Cybersecurity Infrastructure and Security Agency and through tech and through tech is by the way is a taiwanese company um so that that should you know raise some flags there um and they they're working with the company to disclose and to see what how to mitigate those uh, those issues there's actually a cve uh, that that is tracked a cve 2021 28372 um that it's it's called the issue is called a device impersonation vulnerability and it has a high severity of 9.6 out of 10. That's how bad it is. And, and why is that? Uh, what, what the researchers, researchers said is that for uh, a an IoT device using the uh, Thorotex Calais protocol, they found that you only need the unique device identifier, UID, to register that device with uh, Cali's cloud service. So now we see that cloud service comes into, uh, or into, uh, uh, yeah, into the Cali cloud service. Now, and that's all it needs. That's all you need is a device identifier. So somebody can spoof that and and claim to be that device. All they need to have is the device ID. It's kind of like you calling your bank and saying, hey, I'm such and such. And your neighbor can call and say, hey, I'm such and such. Give me that money. And they just give them that. That's all they need is the name, the unique identifier. Now that unique identifier can be gained through very easily through like social social engineering or the like. Um, 
the way it works is that the IoT device will reach out to the Kali network. So you have your smart camera, for example, at home. They'll reach out to the Kali network using that UID and then register with the server. Once it registers with the server, then the communication between the smart device and the and and the and the server is established. Uh, an attacker could register on that network and control the device. And by controlling the device, they can hear everything, see everything. They can also get authentication information from that device. So now they have the username and password. Um, so it's not just it's not just remote access. It's not just credential harvesting. They also have audio and video. They can harvest audio and video data from the device. How do they do that? So they get, let's say, okay, I have ID number one, two, three, four. So, okay, we have this ID number. I'm an attacker. I'm going to spoof any request to the server, to the Kali network. And then we tell them, hey, I'm 1234. Send me this information. And what they look is they send me that information. Okay. Um, now, the, the problem is there are so many manufacturers that are using this technology. So we can't say, okay, you, if you have this device, do this. Or you have device, just do that. They have released a, um, a patch for it. Um, after they have seen a, a proof of concept uh, through the throughout the research, and there's actually a video on YouTube that we will put the link to that shows you how this works. Um, so just look in the description. Uh, now the mitigation options for this is is a little bit uh, more technically advanced than what we're, than what we're aiming to do on this podcast. It's more on the developer side and the owner of the IoT device side. But as long as we are aware, we, we're bringing this up because IoT devices are not going anywhere and it's gonna get more and more. So back to that culture and that sense of security that we always have to have, you know, patch management. Anything, anytime I have, if I decide to use IoT, if I decide, decide to use a phone, decide to use any electronics, I need to make sure that it's always updated. That, that would be your, 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 uh, the biggest uh the biggest thing now the, the the second thing is maybe a little bit different is um don't use don't connect your your iot devices to to public wi-fi networks um you can have a portable speaker maybe and you can connect it to an open network and you know that you don't want to do that because you don't all that information can be sent back and forth in clear text and you don't know and somebody can gain that uid and all they need to do is go to that cali server and get and and gain information. Um, again, just you know, because because the Kali platform is used by by many devices, by a lot of large device manufacturers, is there? It's very difficult for us to, to actually say, and it was very difficult for the researchers to say what devices were you know are affected. So just this is this is more just to you know kind of reiterate our our culture of security. Uh, Carl, you have anything to add? Um. Well, just think about most of these companies that create these IoT devices, they're creating things that are costing like $10, $20. Obviously, security is not going to be on their forefront of mind because I right. could buy a, a light bulb for like 10 bucks, and it has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and all sorts of gizmos built into it. And... They're not going to think about security. So a lot of times we have to, unfortunately, with these IoT devices, take matters in our own hands. And one advice I keep hearing from different professionals is check to see if your router can create like a guest network. And just use that guest network for all your IoT devices. And that guest network would be separated from your main network. So at least that way... They can't attack your IoT device and then gain access to your entire network and then own every device on your network. So it'd be a little small way to like just separate the traffic. Um, what if you have mm -hmm. an or a compromised IoT device mm -hmm. on, on a very secure network behind a firewall? Can you still attack that IoT device and gain access and pivot? Yes, because unfortunately that IoT device, even though 
you may set it up to connect to a network, you could actually, because it's doing Wi-Fi, most likely, you can do what's called a, uh, a re-established attack, which what it will do is it'll send a signal to the router, says, okay, forget about what this IoT device is, kick him off the network, and then as soon as he does that, he'll send an, uh, a uh, signal to the IoT device, say, hey, connect to me and then the attacker is a or is connected to the iot device injects malware into that and then when it goes back onto your home network that malware will then go scanning through the whole network to search for more things to infect okay. yeah so it, i think it's very important to also s separate the IoT devices onto their own guest network if possible. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. That's a very, very valuable input. Yeah. All righty. Let's uh, jump to this fun one. Uh, from the Hacker News, new glowworm attack recovers devices sound from its LED power indicator. Uh, it just shows you how how out of the box threat actors or security professionals, whether you're red hat or a white hat, um, think about different ways of attacking your network, right? And this one, the glowworm attack is, is very ingenious. So the way it works is like this. They, what attacker will do is it, it's called, uh, it leverages what's called optical emanations. So what, what they'll do is, so imagine this, listen to music and turn the, the uh, volume up very high. Every time you see it beating, you'll see the LED light on the speaker change the, the intensity and the brightness of it. That's not because it's reacting to the sound of your speaker, it's because the voltage is being drawn to the speaker and, is, and it's showing on the, LED, on the LED light bulb. So what happens is, is an eavesdropper will be watching from a distance, that light, how, how it changes, how it changes, how it fluctuates. And then there will be an algorithm that will capture all this data that's coming from that minor LED light and translate it into the audio that is being uh, sent through the speaker, which is which is very ingenious if you think about it. Um, the second thing is, you say, oh, well, my speaker doesn't have an LED. Well, your computer itself, if you have a connected computer or a laptop, it may have an LED. So the device that the speakers are connected to will also have fluctuation in power and they'll be able to catch that fluctuation as well. Um, this type of, of, of uh, intelligence gathering is called, there's actually a, a term for it. It's called uh, Tempest. It's a code name. It's a, it's a, and if this is from Wikipedia saying Tempest is a US national security agency specification and NATO certification uh, referring to spying on information systems through leaking emanations, including unintentional radio or, elect or electrical signals, sounds, and vibration. So there's another one that I, that I read. It said um, on, your, on, your, on your phone, on your handheld device, when you tap on your keyboard, that soft keyboard you have on the screen, when you tap on it. Small emanation. Your, yeah, of the servo in there that changes, you know, the every time you tap, you can capture that vibration and, and mm -hmm. know what you like. So it's like a key logger, which, which is very ingenious. Um, the way that attack works, it, it hinges on the, on the optical correlation between the sound it is played uh, and the, the speaker that is connected to and the, the change of intensity in the power of the LED, um, you know, based on the power consumption. Uh, in 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 a real world scenario, tell me okay, how is somebody going to use this? Not spy against spy. Well, we have a lot of incidents about uh, corporate espionage or corporate spying and all that stuff. And somebody, you know, how many conference rooms are rented at hotels and and, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and speeches are given. Well, an attacker can be in the next in the next room or can be sitting in the same, you know, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. The same area in the same general area and they can where they can see the led light and how it works and you know the or 
You don't even have to be somewhere. You can be on a Zoom meeting or it can be on a Google yeah. meeting or a Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or whatever. And somebody who's sitting in a room next to you can watch, uh, you know, can watch the, the LEDs or the power indicators on, on your system. And you can, you know, and you can yeah. gauge the power fluctuation and, and to, to know what you were talking about. Also, um, with many people working from home, the same situation can happen. If you're not mm -hmm. very careful, yep. you could intentionally leak out this information unknowingly. Yep. Now, how can we mitigate this? Very easy. Very easy. We can put um, uh, transistors in the circuit, you know, say so it mitigates that, that power fluctuation, mm -hmm. which is not is going to cost pennies. Uh, if you're spending $1,500 on a laptop, the increase of cost is going to be pennies. Um, but, you know, based on the article saying, you know, while the cost of counter measures is small, given the likelihood of that happening and, the, you know, the amount of devices that are being produced in the market, this has cost millions of dollars, right? Yeah. To companies, millions of dollars is millions of dollars, you know, to them, because it's not, it wouldn't reflect on them. For example, if it wouldn't be like, oh, uh, 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 Intel got got hijacked or got hacked or whatever. If you have an Intel laptop that somebody can 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 hijack that way and, and understand what you're saying, um, and you know it's it, it it's just like you know, given that and having this information, threat actors and re security researchers know that as well. And knowing that the manufacturers, the the computer manufacturers, device manufacturers are not going to handle this. Um, it's going, you know, glow worm is going, to, is going to be exploited for years to come. One of the things that I like to do, for example, but you know, this this can change is I like to put uh, uh, black tape on my LED lights mm -hmm. and on my camera. But the thing is, also they also discovered if you have a light bulb hanging in your ceiling and there's a speaker that's loud enough, it's actually going to be from the vibration of the sound of the speaker. It'll yeah, change the, the yeah the vibration, the the sine with the the wave of the light. <laughs> up in your in your light bulb and they can capture that as well but because of the cost of the equipment to do that it's not you know it's not a pressing issue right now um that's it for this you, you have anything to add Carl? well this glow worm thing that actually isn't anything new like back in the computer days where you had crt monitors the same kind of attack would happen where crt monitors would vibrate like very ultra violet or ultra outside the human eye range. But if you have the right telescope or something to capture those vibrations and you can actually recreate what's on the screen based upon what's being vibrated out. And wow. that's pretty scary. Yeah. So that's why a lot of, a lot of time, uh, the older days, that's where the uh, privacy screen started coming into play. Where they would I put see. that above that because that would mitigate the reflections of the monitors. Uh -huh. So that that could be one way to mitigate this on your cell phone because the privacy screen will also alter the way the light is uh, the light from the phone is being reflected out. It'll distort it enough to where you can't really get a good gauge of what's being on the screen. So. That's wow. that's my two cents on that. <laughs> nice. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, I guess we'll go on to the two major data breaches that happened. So the first one is involving uh, T-Mobile customers. A uh, hacker is claiming to have stolen data from more than 100 million T-Mobile users in the, the U.S., and the information is on sale for roughly $277,000. Um, what's kind of scary is the stolen data may include phone numbers, social security numbers, unique IMEI numbers, which are basically numbers that identify one phone from another phone, uh, physical addresses, and even driver's license information. So, wow. Yeah. And with this huge amount of data being stolen, so the question is, well, what could happen with it? Well, many things can happen. One thing could be spear phishing attacks where each customer will get uh, 
emails from T-Mobile that may seem really legit because they have your information from this data breach and say, hey, your account been compromised. Click this button here to change your password or something. And then you click on the link and then it goes to a malicious site. Another thing that they could use this information is uh, the swim, the SIM swap attacks, where they will actually call up T-Mobile and have all of your information and say, "Hey, I need to get a new SIM for my car or for my phone because it got stolen." And because they have all your data already, they can just say, "Hey, T-Mobile asks, what's your PIN? PIN is one two three four, whatever it may be," and it'll be easy for them to take it. Um, so the things that you should do right away is definitely change your password and your security pins right away. This is very important because, because now the, the hacker has that information from this data breach. And it's even if you're not directly a T-Mobile customer, like say you are a Metro PCS customer or a Mint or a Ting, I would still do the same thing because those are owned by T-Mobile. And also, if you are on a carrier that uses the T-Mobile network, I would also change your passwords and pins just because you don't really know how much information that carrier is sharing with T-Mobile because they may have a database on those customers because that carrier is using their network. They may say, hey, in order to use our network, you have to give us your customer data. So just to be 100% safe, if you are on T-Mobile or your carrier uses a T-Mobile network, definitely change your password and pins for, your, for everything there. And another thing is use an app-based authenticator app for two-factor instead of the text messages because now they can do this SIM swap attack. Text messages for your two-factor are no longer secure because they can just take over your cell phone number and say you request a uh, two-factor and it'll get texted to the attacker instead of you. And here's the scariest part here. T-Mobile has experienced as many as six separate data breaches in the past four years. Wow. That's almost two every year. If two and that, a half. Yeah, two and, like, two and a half every year. That is kind of scary. This shows that many companies do not take security as seriously as they should just because security is more of a – cost than a benefit it benefits the customer but it does not always benefit the business so that's why it's very important to keep on top of your data and keep on top of all of these issues because a lot of the times the companies are not going to have your back and if you are a t-mobile uh, customer and this fact that six data breaches within the four years scares you get out of T-Mobile and use something else <laughs> because yeah, obviously they do not care about protecting your data. And as scary as that is data breaches are happening more and more often. And this next uh, topic is a data breach that happened for they're targeting mostly senior citizens. So a cybersecurity research has found a misconfigured Amazon S3 bucket. Now what an S3 bucket is, is Amazon will have, has multiple, multiple different servers and they rent out different servers to different businesses. And that portion that they rent out to a company is what they'll call a bucket. So the server, AKA bucket, will be leased out to a company and the company puts in their data and use it for whatever reason, uh, either computing reasons or just storing data to be later retrieved. And this bucket was misconfigured in a way that anyone could actually just walk right into it without 
any authentication at all. And it exposed a lot of personal identify, identifying information for over 3 million senior citizens. Now the company involved in this was a uh, senior advocator. It describes itself as the largest ratings and review website for senior care and services across US and Canada. The misconfigured, misconfigured server had over 180 gigabytes of information. These include names, contact details, and many, many other private information like addresses and social security numbers. It's like, and the list goes on and on and on how much information they had. 180 gigabytes of information In just text, out there. That is a lot. Yeah, that and just text. Lot. That's a lot of information. It may not sound a lot like, oh, I have a terabyte. No, text information, like text files. So you can have millions, like, yeah, 3 million people were affected by this. So this is a big deal. So what is the main attack for this? The reason this should be taken very seriously is a lot of this information can be used to attack the seniors and have them fall for things like tech support scams, uh, sweepstakes scams, online shopping scams, and phone scams, in which they use their PII to make the victim think, oh, you're talking to a legitimate company that really wants to either give me something or say they want to help me out or something like, oh, my computer's not working. I'm calling here from Microsoft because you have a virus and pay me X amount of dollars and we'll get rid of it for you. But in fact, there's no viruses, there's not none of these scams and they just steal the money from the people and just run off into the sunset. So what can be done in this situation is if you have a parent that, or a neighbor or anyone that you care for that is of senior age, definitely keep an eye on their credit and definitely keep an eye out for suspicious calls and emails. Kind of warn them that, hey, this may happen and just let me know if this does happen so that you can protect them. Say, hey, this is a scam. Don't, don't fall for it. This isn't who they think they are. And with the credit, is you've got to make sure that they're not going to steal their identity to try to rack up the bill that they can't pay for. Because a lot of times, seniors have a lot of money and also usually good credit because they've lived long lives. And, and so what they'll do is they'll take their PII and take out either credit card or mortgages to their houses or whatever they can get their hands on to get money. And instead of the bills going to the attackers, they go to the, to the senior person. Okay? And they're stuck with thousands upon thousands or millions in some cases of debt that they'll never be able to pay off. So one particular site that I kind of like for watching your credit is called Credit Karma. They offer you a free service where you can keep an eye on your credit scores and they'll alert you when new things get added to your credit score that you may not know about. Like if someone opens up a new credit card, that will affect your credit score. And they'll say, hey, this new line of credit has been added to your account. If this isn't you, you should look into it. If it is you, don't worry about it. So that's another thing that you could use to protect yourself because the attackers have your information and they're not afraid to use it. And for both of these data breaches and many other data breaches that will happen in the future, the biggest way, actually the only way to protect yourself in that is only give the company as much information as you need to give them. Like for T-Mobile, 
I don't think there's any reason why they should have your social security number and your driver's license number for self-service. Why would they need that information? And I would even argue that they may not even need your home address for cell service because nowadays, oh, yeah. yeah, or even your name, yeah. they don't need that. It's like, yeah. and also, if you think about it, in this day and age, why would they need your address either? What are they shipping to you? Because you can do all your billing online through auto pay, and you can have all of your bills sent to you through email. So they don't really need your address at all. So you can just give them a fake address if they insist on needing an address. And then with your name, give them whatever name that you want to because obviously they don't really need your real name. And definitely don't give your social security number out to them or your driver's license number because they don't really need it for self-service. And that's I think that's the only way that you can protect yourself is to be very careful about what information you give them. Like I said, just give them just the bare minimum that they would need to give you the services. Because if they don't have the information on you, the attackers can't steal it. And the worst part is with these databases, you're not in control of them. You can't say, oh, I'm going to go in here and change the password to the server so that no one else can get my information. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. It, yeah. Even with this uh, senior advisor, the the people who were in charge of this didn't configure it correctly, and it was wide open for anyone to come in and just take whatever they wanted. And I guarantee none of the customers even knew about that. Yep. And it's kind of hard to protect yourself if – a, you don't know about it, and B, when you have no control over it. So, yeah, just be very careful about what information you give out to them. I know we live in a day and age where we like to give out information for services or whatever, but eventually that stockpile information can be used against you. So you have to be very cautious about how much you give out. And I know it may seem kind of like, oh, I have nothing to hide, but at the same time, yeah, you may have nothing to hide, but do you really want to let the world know my social security number is da 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 da, da or I live at this address, or I have this amount of money in my bank account? No. If you want tell that. Me all that information, I'll take care of you. Yeah. It's yeah, like – <laughs> it's it's just insane that you would want any of that information out. So just be very careful about how much you give out because if, like I said, if the company doesn't have it, they can't get leaked out. And is there anything else you want to add in? Um, yeah, a couple of things. One is about the S3 bucket and one about credit karma. Okay. Uh, so the S3 bucket, just like you said, Carl, you know, you have no control over it. Just I wanted to kind of, explain a little bit what an s3 bucket is not really a server or it's not part of a server it's kind of like imagine a bucket and a bucket you can pick it up and move it right mm -hmm. so a bucket can be here today and can be here tomorrow and can be here the next day and but i have access to it and that's kind of like what it is you know it's 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 a space that you that you that you're renting right cloud space that you're renting to keep your stuff on there now it can be small personal or it can be big like for you know for large corporations right um so it's kind of like it's not it's not something you can say oh well it's an amazon product it's amazon's fault well not really because amazon secures everything uh, all that data while it's there but it's your job to secure your part of it so it's like it's security is like yeah. it is it, it, where it's your job and amazon job or your job or the administrator's job and the cloud provider's job, right? It's it's a shared yeah. responsibility. Um, the second thing I wanted to kind of mention is Credit Karma. I personally don't have any financial apps on my phone. And I didn't used to be like this, but I, I, I heard it. I learned it from, you know, uh, uh, one of the security researchers. I don't remember his name right now, but he's big in the industry. And since I heard it, it actually makes sense. I don't need to have my bank information on my phone. Um, I don't need to have my credit information on my phone. I didn't have my credit card on my phone. Um, what I did is I enabled email alerts. So I downloaded the app. Like, for example, I had Credit Karma, 
downloaded it, enable email alerts, and then remove the app from your phone. Remember, yeah. security is about layers, right? So if somebody gets access to my phone and they're able to get in my phone because they were able to get my PIN number or whatever, they won't find anything in there, right? Kind of mm -hmm. like, um, uh, like think about it. Do I need? Why do I need to have this on my phone? Um, am I using it daily? Am I? Do I have yeah. a more secure means of accessing it? Can I do this on my laptop instead? You know, things like that. Yeah. Uh, so that's that. That'll be one thing I would recommend as well. Is 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 set up email alerts, then remove the app from your phone. Or even don't even use the app at all because you don't have to use the app. You can just go to the website and use it on yep, really. your laptop. So, but there are some apps where you can't. You say, "Oh, you have yeah. to download the app." Well, that's why. Was it Robinhood? I think. That yeah, Robinhood is an app only, but that's why I kind of <laughs> recommend Credit Karma because you don't need to use the app for it. You can just go on the website and okay. go to creditkarma.com, do set everything up so that you get the email alerts, and then. If you need to log in to either update something or to check something out or to dispute something, you can go through the website to do that because Credit Karma also allows you to dispute anything on your credit history. Like if an attacker does mention to manage to uh, open up a credit card, you can go to Credit Karma and say, no, that's not me. And then they will fight for you to get that off your credit history for free too. Oh, I didn't know they did, uh, disputes for you on your behalf. Yeah. That's cool. So that oh, could be another tool that you yeah. can use. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I think that will end it. Anything else you want to add? Nope. All right. Um so I so this will conclude this week in the simple cyber defense security updates. Uh, you can look at look us up on any of the social medias or just remember to like, subscribe, and share this with anyone that you think will benefit from this, and we'll see you in the next episode. If you like what was in this episode, please consider liking, subscribing, and sharing with others. For more information, to suggest a topic, or to donate, head over to simplecyberdefense.com.